The Ancient City, Book 2, Chapter 9, Morals of the Ancient Family. History does not study material facts and institutions alone. Its true object of study is the human mind. It should aspire to know what this mind has believed, thought, and felt in the different ages of the life of the human race. We described, at the opening of this book, the ancient opinion which men held concerning their destiny after death. We have shown how this creed produced domestic institutions and private law. It remains to discover what its action was upon morals in primitive societies. Without pretending that this old religion created moral sentiments in the heart of man, we may at least believe that it was associated with them to fortify them, to give them greater authority, to assure their supremacy and their right of direction over the conduct of men, sometimes also to give them a false bias. The religion of these primitive ages was exclusively domestic, so also were morals. Religion did not say to a man, showing him another man, that is thy brother. It said to him, that is a stranger, he cannot participate in the religious acts of thy hearth, he cannot approach the tomb of thy family, he has other gods than thine, and cannot unite with thee in a common prayer. Thy gods reject his adoration and regard him as their enemy. He is thy foe also. In this religion of the hearth, man never supplicates the divinity in favor of other men. He invokes him only for himself and his. A Greek proverb has remained as a souvenir and a vestige of this ancient isolation of man in prayer. In Plutarch's time they still said to the egotist, You sacrifice to the hearth. This signified, You separate yourself from other citizens. You have no friends. Your fellow men are nothing to you. You live solely for yourself and yours. This proverb pointed to a time when, all religion being around the hearth, the horizon of morals and of affection had not yet passed beyond the narrow circle of the family. It is natural that moral ideas, like religious ideas, should have their commencement and progress, and the god of the primitive generations in this race was very small. By degrees men made him larger. So morals, very narrow and incomplete at first, became insensibly enlarged, until, from stage to stage, they reached the point of proclaiming the duty of love towards all mankind. The point of departure was the family and it was under the influence of the domestic religion that duties first appeared to the eyes of man. Let us picture to ourselves this religion of the fire and of the tomb in its flourishing period. Man sees a divinity near him. It is present, like conscience itself, to his minutest actions. This fragile being finds himself under the eye of a witness who never leaves him. He never feels himself alone. At his side in the house... In the field he has protectors to sustain him in the toils of life, and judges to punish his guilty actions. The Lares, said the Romans, are formidable divinities, whose duty it is to punish mankind and to watch over all that passes in the interior of the house. The Penates they also describe as gods who enable us to live, they nourish our bodies and regulate our minds. Men loved to apply to the holy fire the epithet of chaste, and they believed that it enjoined chastity upon mortals. No act materially or morally impure could be committed in its presence. The first ideas of wrong, of chastisement, of expiation, seem to have come from this. The man who felt guilty no longer dared to approach his own hearth. His god repelled him. He who had shed blood was no longer allowed to sacrifice, or to offer libations, or prayer, or to offer the sacred repast. The god was so severe that he admitted no excuse. He did not distinguish between an involuntary murder and a premeditated crime. The hand stained with blood could no longer touch sacred objects. To enable a man to renew his worship, and to regain possession of his god, he was required at least to purify himself by an expiatory ceremony. This religion knew pity, and had rights to efface the stains of the soul. Narrow and material as it was, it still knew how to console man for his errors. 
if it absolutely ignored the duties of charity, at any rate it traced for man with admirable precision his family duties. It rendered marriage obligatory. Celibacy was a crime in the eyes of a religion that made the perpetuity of the family the first and most holy of duties. But the union which it prescribed could be accomplished only in the presence of the domestic divinities. It is the religious, sacred, indissoluble union of the husband and wife. No man could omit the rites and make of marriage a simple contract by consent, as it became in the latest period of Greek and Roman society. This ancient religion forbade it, and if one dared to offend in this particular, it punished him for it. For the son sprung from such a union was considered a bastard, that is to say, a being who had neither place nor sacred fire. He had no right to perform any sacred act. He could not pray. This same religion watched with care over the purity of the family. In its eyes the greatest of crimes was adultery, for the first rule of the worship was that the sacred fire should be transmitted from father to son, and adultery disturbed the order of birth. Another rule was that the tomb should contain only members of the family, but the son born of adultery was a stranger. If he was buried in the tomb, all the principles of the religion were violated, the worship defiled, the sacred fire became impure, every offering at the tomb became an act of impiety. Worse still, by adultery, the series of descendants was broken. The family, even though living men knew it not, became extinct, and there was no more divine happiness for the ancestors. The Hindu also says, The son born of adultery annihilates in this world and in the next the offerings made to the manas. Here is the reason that the laws of Greece and Rome give the father the right to reject the child just born. Here, too, is the reason that they are so rigorous, so inexorable against adultery. At Athens the husband is allowed to kill the guilty one. At Rome the husband, as the wife's judge, condemns her to death. This religion was so severe that a man had not even the right to pardon completely, and that he was forced at least to repudiate his wife. These then are the first moral and domestic laws discovered and sanctioned. Here is, besides the natural sentiment, an imperious religion which tells the husband and wife that they are united forever, and that from this union flow rigorous duties, the neglect of which brings with it the gravest consequences in this life and in the next. Hence came the serious and sacred character of the conjugal union among the ancients, and the purity which the family long preserved. This domestic morality prescribed still other duties. It taught the wife that she ought to obey the husband that he ought to command. It instructed both to respect each other. The wife had rights, for she had her place at the sacred fire. It was her duty to see that it did not die out. She too then has her priesthood. Where she is not found, the domestic worship is incomplete and insufficient. It was a great misfortune to a Greek to have a hearth deprived of a wife. Among the Romans, the presence of the wife was so necessary in the sacrifices that the priest lost his office on becoming a widower. It was doubtless to this division of the domestic priesthood that the mother of the family owed the veneration with which they never ceased to surround her in Greek and Roman society. Hence it came that the wife had the same title in the family as the husband. The Romans said pater familias and mater familias, the Greeks Ekodeopis and Ekodeopina, the Hindus, Grihapati and Grehapatni. Hence also came this formula which the wife pronounced in the Roman marriage, Ubi tu Caius ego Caia, a formula which tells us that, if in the house there was not equal authority, there was equal dignity. As to the son, we have seen him subject to the authority of a father who could sell him or condemn him to death. But this son had also his part in the worship. He filled a place in the religious ceremonies. His presence on certain days was so necessary that the Roman who had no son was forced to adopt a fictitious one for those days in order that the rites might be performed. And here religion established a very powerful bond between father and son. They believed in a second life in the tomb, a life happy and calm if the funeral repasts were regularly offered. Thus the father is convinced that his destiny after this life will depend upon the care that his son will take of his tomb. 
and the son on his part is convinced that his father will become a god after death, whom he will have to invoke. We can imagine how much respect and reciprocal affection this belief would establish in the family. The ancients gave to the domestic virtues the name of piety, the obedience of the son to his father, the love which he bore to his mother. This was piety, pietas erga parentes. The attachment of the father for the child, the tenderness of the mother, these too were piety, pietas erga liberos. Everything in the family was divine. The sense of duty, natural affection, the religious idea, all these were confounded, were considered as one, and were expressed by the same word. It will perhaps appear strange to find love of home counted among the virtues, but it was so counted among the ancients. This sentiment had a deep and powerful hold upon their minds. Anchises, when he sees Troy in flames, is still unwilling to leave his old home. Ulysses, when countless treasures and immortality itself are offered him, wishes only again to see the flame of his own hearth fire. Let us come down to Cicero's time. It is no longer a poet but a statesman who speaks. Here is my religion. Here is my race. Here are the traces of my forefathers. I cannot express the charm which I find here, and which penetrates my heart and my senses. We must place ourselves, in thought, in the midst of these primitive generations, to understand how lively and powerful were these sentiments, which were already enfeebled in Cicero's day. For us the house is merely a domicile, a shelter. We leave it and forget it with little trouble. Or, if we are attached to it, this is merely by the force of habit or of recollections, because, for us, religion is not there. Our God is the God of the universe, and we find Him everywhere. It was entirely different among the ancients. They found their principal divinity within the house. This was their providence, which protected them individually, which heard their prayers, and granted their wishes. Out of the house, man no longer felt the presence of a god. The god of his neighbor was a hostile god. Then a man loved his house as he now loves his church. Thus the religion of the primitive ages was not foreign to the moral development of this part of humanity. Their gods enjoined purity and forbade the shedding of blood. The notion of justice, if it was not born of this belief, must at least have been fortified by it. These gods belonged in common to all the members of the same family. Thus the family was united by a powerful tie, and all its members learned to love and respect each other. These gods lived in the interior of each house. A man loved his house, his home, fixed and durable, which he had received from his ancestors, and which he transmitted to his children as a sanctuary. Ancient morality, governed by this belief, knew no charity, but it taught at least the domestic virtues. Among this race, the isolation of the family was the commencement of morals. Duties, clear, precise, and imperious, appeared, but they were restricted within a narrow circle. This narrow character of primitive morals we must recollect as we proceed, for civil society, founded later on these same principles, put on the same character, and several singular traits of ancient politics are explained by this fact. Footnote. What is said of ancient morals in this chapter is intended to apply to those peoples that afterwards became Greeks and Romans. This morality was modified with time, especially among the Greeks. Already in the Odyssey we find new sentiments and other manners. <laughs>